The woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. This is what we call a kickoff weekend. It marks the, uh, the week where all of our ministries that either pressed pause or changed up their programming over the summer uh, start back up and get back into what is their normal, regular weekly ministry. So uh, student ministry kicked it off last night, uh, the splatter paint party. Apologize for the state of your cars now. They are probably messier than they were. Believe me, that hurts my heart. Uh, but the, they, it was just a blast, a lot of fun there. And as you heard, Woodman U, uh, community groups, all of them start up this week. It is a great time to get involved. So whether you're new over the summer or whether just ready to get back into it, we have got a place for you. You're welcome here. Simply put, no matter who you are, or what you have done. And none of us are so far gone that God cannot reach us. And that's, in fact, what we're going to study today. Uh, we're beginning a series uh, entitled Jesus the Servant from the Gospel of Mark. And the Gospel of Mark is uh, widely regarded to have been the first gospel written. I know that comes out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Mark was the first. And it was based on the teaching ministry of the Apostle Peter, who was one of the disciples of Jesus. And the entire book is essentially a, a, a demonstration of what Jesus did and an invitation to relationship with him. Uh, it, it reads the most like an action movie of, of all the Gospels. Uh, you know how when you were a kid and like the essay had to be a thousand words long and you were adding an extra one just to fill the space? Uh, Mark didn't have a word thing, so he's very direct. He gets right after it. It's also the shortest Gospel, consequently. Now, our passage today highlights the fact that nobody is beyond God's reach, having said that. On the surface of it, it's also one of the most difficult in the gospel. In part because of Mark's brevity, he just sort of lays it out there and walks away and doesn't unpack it all that much. If you are new to this stuff, I'll, I'll tell you, it, 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 gets a little, it gets a little awkward, but, but, I, but I want you to stay with us because it gets really much better. And if you have ever felt like you are an outsider looking in, if you've ever felt, maybe sitting here right now, that you don't belong here, you're gonna see that that feeling is to your advantage. And, and this, this passage could change you. And I'm praying toward that end. Let's pray and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this weekend. Thank you for all the ministries that are going to uh, kick up and start. Thank you in advance for the ministry that will be done. Father, I, I, I have to imagine that there's some people who are, are a little uncomfortable right now. We, we've sang songs they don't know, but everyone around us seemed to. Plate goes past, what's that for? God, I pray that you would reveal your heart 
for those on the outside. God, help us to have ears to hear because this gets bumpy. Be glorified. And, and God, help me with the part that I play now. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we're beginning in verse 24, and it begins with a short break. It says this, and from there, he, he being Jesus, arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. So it begins from there, I guess our question is from where, the last time we had a little geography ping was back in Mark chapter 6 verse 53, where it tells us that Jesus uh, was in Gennesaret. Uh, that means that now he's traveled some 30 miles northwest into this region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, when he was in Gennesaret, last thing we saw at the beginning of chapter 7 is Jesus had had a spicy little exchange with Pharisees and scribes. Uh, the Pharisees well regarded themselves as the religious elite in Israel, and the scribes were considered the experts in the Old Testament law. Jesus there had to set them straight on what makes a person clean or unclean. Now, see, the religious dudes thought that you could become unclean by touching things. Jesus says, well, good news is you don't get unclean by touching stuff. Bad news is you're already unclean because of the naughty little heart inside of you. For, for it's out of our hearts that come evil. You don't catch it. You've already got it. The exchange comes after what was a pretty intense time of ministry for Jesus. So it's not surprising uh, that just like I hope you enjoyed last weekend, Jesus and the disciples were like, it's time for a little break. Long weekend, let's get out of town. This is something that Jesus often we see do. Take moments of rest. What's surprising is where he goes. You can tell he wants to get away because he goes to a spot that nobody's going to follow him. Uh, see, the region of Tyre and Sidon um, was a Gentile region. It was beyond the borders of ancient Israel, and Jesus rarely went there. Now, the fact that Tyre's on the Mediterranean coast maybe helped. Kind of a nice place to be. This is modern-day Lebanon. But it was not a place that was popular for long weekends with Jews. The Jewish historian Josephus, referring to the people of Tyre, he called them our bitterest enemies. Not where many Jews went. And he goes, looking to have a little break, he goes into a house, and it says, he did not want anyone to know a little me time for Jesus. Yet, he could not be hidden. Jesus' fame had spread far and wide. Even back in Mark chapter 3, we saw people from Tyre and Sidon come down and hear him. And he can't keep it a secret any longer. Now, I don't want to make too big a deal of this because it gets away from sort of the main point of, of what we're trying to look at today. But it is noticeable, notable, that Jesus, who, who is the sovereign God of the universe, found it necessary at times to take breaks and step back from ministry. Now, as a pastor, it's a little scary to say this because I don't want you to take it as license and then check out of everything. But this is a good time of year as things are amping back up at church, as things are probably amping back up into family schedules with school and sports, to evaluate and ask yourself, is what I'm about to do sustainable? And is there a chance you need to take a step back from something? The fact of the matter is we spend a lot of our time doing things that aren't gonna matter. Your kid's not good at sports, right? Get over it. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and, and when it comes to church stuff, 
Hear, hear it from up front. If in the busyness of your schedule, and this is understandable, you're like, I, I, I got like a couple spots. I, I, I'm going to go to church on the weekend, and, I, and I, I have maybe one other spot. I would rather you choose like Woodman U or a community group before you do anything else. I'd rather know that you're in an environment where you're getting filled up instead of throwing you into something where you're going to be pouring yourself out and find yourself even more spent. By God's grace, we've got a pretty big body, and if this is a time where you need to step out of some serving and just get into something to fill you up, we've got other people who I trust are going to help carry that load. But maybe you're trying to do too much. And if Jesus took short breaks, I think we're able to too. Now, we get into the real meat of the story. An outsider asks for help. Look at verse 25. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So what the disciples thought was going to be a sweet little long weekend, this woman views as a sweet opportunity. For she has a daughter who's possessed by a demon, and she believes that Jesus can help her. However, even before this woman opens her mouth, even before she stepped into that house, this gal had three big things against her. Number one, she was a woman. And in their culture, the Jews did not regard women with dignity or equality. They were not even considered to be a reliable witness in a court of law. They were not respected. Secondly, she was a woman and a Gentile. That is, she was a non-Jew woman. And the Gentiles, the Jews didn't like them. If you were at our Heights campus last weekend, uh, Pastor Andrew talked about the stigma that would fall upon a leper, how, how, how leprosy would make a Jewish person unclean. And, it, and if you were to touch a leper, you yourself would become ceremonially unclean. Many Jews back then thought if you touched a Gentile, you would become ceremonially unclean. You say, well, what did the Gentile have or what did the Gentile do? They were born a Gentile. They, they considered Gentiles innately, in and of themselves, just because they were not Jewish, unclean. And so you have this woman who's a Gentile rolling up into a home before Jesus. But what's even more, she was a Syrophoenician. That is, this gal was from Tyre who Josephus says was our bitterest enemies. And the city from which, if you ever kind of get into the Old Testament stuff, uh, when you read about Elijah, there was this gal named Jezebel. You heard that one before? Girl was an absolute train wreck and almost destroyed the northern kingdom single-handedly. Guess where she was from? Tyre. Even before she opens her mouth, She's got marks against her. If the Pharisees and the scribes, who Jesus had just had the spicy exchange with, if they had watched this, their heads would spin. And the disciples even, the disciples were not having it. Matthew records this very same story, but in his, in his account in Matthew 15, 23, the disciples go up to Jesus and they say, send her away, for she is crying out to us for help. Wait, wait. Why do you want me to send her away? She's crying out for help. This woman, Gentile, Syrophoenician, just get rid of her. Now for us, you know, living some 2,000 years removed in the United States of America, we shudder at the thought, right? For we hold these truths to be self-evident 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It wasn't so back then. And if I could say it nicely, I don't know if we're as awesome at it now as we think we are. You don't have to raise your hand, because I mean, it certainly wouldn't apply to us. Have you ever maybe had an interaction with somebody in the service industry who clearly doesn't speak English as their first language? And you leave frustrated because they should just learn to speak American? Have you ever seen someone destitute, destitute, strung out on drugs, homeless, and with disdain thought if they would just get their act together, they wouldn't be in that position? Do you think in 2,000 years we've got the women's thing right? Do you think women are no longer objectified in our culture? Do you think all women are treated with dignity, respect, and equality because we've come so far? The little litmus test guys, right? Think of the jokes and the things that your dudes say Friday night. Would you share those same comments with the women you love? Do you think people of color enjoy justice to an equal degree across these 50 states? For as far as we think we have come, We still have work to do. And I say that because before we look too judgmentally down on these people, we got our own stuff. We've come a long way. But we got a long way to go. Now maybe more personally for you, but you don't have to raise your hand. Do you feel like people look at you like that here? Are you in one of these campuses? And you feel like an outsider? Do you feel like you don't belong? We, we don't want that. And Jesus doesn't want that. And, and, and we're going to see that. However, it's going to get real bumpy before we do. So especially if you're new to this stuff, like tray table up, seat upright, belt fastened, this gets bumpy. This woman, her daughter possessed by a demon, comes to Jesus, an outsider, but looking for help. And Jesus' response is, not yet. Verse 27. And he said to her, Jesus said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, best case, some of us are kind of like, that's awkward. Worst case, some of you are like, Jesus sounds like a jerk. Most of us are like, did he really just call that woman a dog? The only thing that I can say that maybe makes it a little better, at least he didn't call her a cat, because that, (laughs) that would be mean. (laughs) This riles commentators and it riles people who study it because they, they, they try to look for something to soften it. Some commentators say that that Jesus, when, when he said these words, he must have said it with like a twinkle in his eye, like with a grin, like, oh, I'll let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Better? Other commentators like to point out, and this is true, that the word for dog there isn't the regular word for dog. It's, it's, it's actually the word for a little dog. So quick poll amongst our women. Better? Oh, no, no, I didn't call you a dog. I called you a little dog. Oh, (laughs) whoo, thought that was getting bad. Listen, then and now, 
Jesus is using strong language. And this is especially troublesome if you grew up or if you were introduced to gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And so maybe you need to take just a second to recalibrate your view of Jesus. He is not a pushover. Jesus is not against saying hard things to bring people to a decision. And Jesus is always, ever loving in everything that he does. There's two things, especially for us living 2,000 years after the fact in a different culture, need to remember. Number one, Jesus was a Jewish man. He was the Jewish Messiah. And second, he often spoke in parables. He used used stories and word pictures to convey a deeper meaning. The little history lesson, God picked, God chose the Israelites to be his chosen people from whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. It's biblical fact. Right from the beginning in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God, speaking to a man named Abraham, said, you will be the father of my people, and through you, all the nations of the world would be blessed. The prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years later, sort of midway through, they hadn't dropped that program. That was still the mission, that, that the Jews would be a light to the nations. Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah envisions a day when all of the nations would come flowing to the house of God. Jesus was in that stream. He was a Jew. When he started his ministry, he picked 12 Jewish men, reflective of the 12 tribes of Israel. And when Jesus first sent them out, We read in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus first sent them out on their first little mission trip, he said, don't go into Gentile places. First go to the lost sheep of Israel. And it's a parable. So to kind of fast forward and unpack it, in his parable, the children in the parable are the children of God, the Jews. The bread in the parable is the message and ministry of Jesus. The dogs in the parable are the Gentiles. That's a pretty harsh word to to use of them. Yeah, that was a common derogatory term the Jews used for Gentiles. Now, silver lining? Jesus holds out a little hope, doesn't he? Because what's he say? First. He doesn't say the dogs never will be fed. He says right now, the bread's got to go to the kids. What? First. The children eat first. For you, Not yet. Now, if... Step aside just from the narrative for a moment because there's a couple things that I think we don't get a lot of chance to just kind of think about. (laughs) Jesus was a Jewish man. He was the Jewish Messiah. Jesus was a big fan of the Old Testament. And I say that because sometimes in our culture and our understanding... We're not so much. Probably none of us, but you know, some people look at God in the Old Testament like, wow, that guy was hot. That guy was angry. That guy was mean, but Jesus is so awesome. Sometimes I think we feel that we're going to roll up into heaven and see Jesus, 
And he's going to be kind of looking at his feet a little sheepish, kind of like you felt when you were bringing friends home and your dad was washing the car in short shorts and a tank top, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, this is awful, right? Look, Jesus is not embarrassed about anything in the Old Testament. There's nothing that God did in the Old Testament that Jesus said, Dad, what are you doing? Jesus believed the Old Testament. He did not come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. And the God of the Old Testament is the God of today. And Jesus Christ is his son. He has no regrets. The second thing that we don't often think about is that the the early church, they were on this program too. In every city that the Apostle Paul went, The Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary who ever lived. He brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. But in every city he went, do you know where he went first? The synagogue. He always started at the synagogue. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And we look at it now and we do get a little twitchy when we think about God choosing people, God electing a certain group of people. But it's in the Bible and these pages never make an excuse for it. A Gentile woman from Syrophoenicia comes up to Jesus asking for help and he legitimately says, not yet. to the Jew first. How would you respond at that moment? A lot of us think, good gracious, it's just a mom looking for help. What is astounding, what is marvelous, is the woman understands what Jesus is saying and she responds in faith and humility. Look at verse 28. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. There's a couple firsts there, right? Number one, this is the first and only time in the gospel of Mark where somebody addresses Jesus as Lord. The only time in the Gospel of Mark someone addresses Jesus as Lord is a Gentile woman. Secondly, this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark Jesus speaks in a parable and the person he's speaking to hears it and understands. Time and time and time again, Jesus is teaching. He's talking in parables and then they go into the house and the disciples are like, dude, what are you talking about? I don't even understand. And the, the first one who gets it is a Gentile woman. She understands what he is saying. And what is so witty, she responds to Jesus in the parable. She steps to Jesus. Jesus throws down a parable. She answers him in the parable. With faith, she believes Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and she understands as such, she's the outsider. She essentially says, Jesus, I know, I know the Jews are first. I know that I am outside. I know you should not take their bread and give it to us. I recognize it, but you know what, Jesus? I also know something about kids. I know the way they eat, and I know that crumbs are gonna fall from what you've given them. I don't want you to take from them. I just wanna have the crumb they drop.
That's not breaking the order of things. I don't want you to take their bread and give it to me. I want the crumbs they forget about. There's a lot of us here who would claim faith in Jesus. A lot of us here would say we believe like she believed Jesus is the Messiah. But, but what she possessed, what really gave the weight to her comments is the thing that not all of us, I say this kindly, do. She had humility. Not many of us, men or women, would take too kindly to someone we'd never talked to before calling us a dog. Calling me a dog? You think what you think just because you had different parents, you're from a different country, you think, well, you're not going to help me because, okay, you know what? Fine. She's not like us. She's like, I know you came for the Jews first. I don't want you to take their bread. Listen, call me a dog. Call me whatever you want. Rightfully, you could call me a lot worse. I do. I'm bringing nothing to this. I am on my knees. My daughter needs help. I am begging you. You can do it. Just give me a crumb. I've got nowhere else to go. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what's the biggest stumbling block to so many of us trusting Christ as Savior. I think too many in the modern church, though we would never say it out loud, when we pray, when we ask for things, we sort of think God owes us one. My service, my giving, my time, my acts of kindness. I'm not perfect, but so much better than they are. Help a brother out. This woman came to Jesus fully convinced, I am nothing. Except in need. Help me. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that all have fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us across all of these campuses, not one person has any lay to claim, any claim to lay to say that I have something that makes me different and you, you owe this to me. We were all dead in our sin and desperately need of a savior and Jesus offers us forgiveness through grace but it requires humility to accept it you know you talk about people that you want to meet when you get to heaven you know and I'll tell you this week this lady has risen considerably on my list I can't think of many others. She, she, she steps to Jesus. She challenges him with his own words and receives what it was she came looking for. An outsider. It shows us that we can be saved no matter who you are or what you have done, if you respond to Jesus in faith with humility, he will respond to you. Look at verse 29. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Now, I can't say for certain because I don't know, but I got to imagine when Jesus said that, 
I bet he had a twinkle in his eye then. That he sat back and he thought, I've been with these mojos for how long? <laughs> they have never connected the dots. Lady, I have stood before the religious elite of my country and it did not compute. And you are a woman who's never had any formal education. You are a Gentile. You were not brought up in the faith and you are our bitterest enemy. And you get it. And to you and your kind belong the kingdom of God. Go for this statement. Your daughter is made well. Only time in the gospel of Mark, Jesus healed from a distance. And we're not going to waste any more of your time, lady. It's done. And Jesus would do it for you. But it's not just believing that Jesus died for the sins of the world. It's also having the humility to acknowledge, and I needed him to do it for me. I once heard the story, and I don't even know if it's true, <laughs> about a slave owner and a slave. And the slave would be in the mud working and singing every day, and the slave owner comes on his white horse in his white suit, and he goes, why are you singing? The slave looks up at him and says, get off that horse and I'll show you. The slave owner, incensed, has him beaten. Not many days later, same situation, sees the same slave beaten up but singing in the mud. Slave owner comes up and says, why are you singing? He says, get off that horse and I'll show you. And again, the slave is beaten. And this happens time and time and time again until one day the slave owner in his white suit, on his white horse, sees in a distance the slave singing in the mud and he can't take it anymore and he jumps off his horse and he runs through the mud and he grabs him and he says, tell me, why are you singing? The slave owner says, sir, I think you've already found it or at least you're close. He goes, what are you talking about? You had to be willing to get off your horse. Now, not all of us are riding horses to work. But a lot of us have things that we think make us special and set us above other people. And to receive Christ as Savior, you got to get off that horse. The gospel of Jesus Christ is tremendously great news. It is the most magnificent thing I have ever heard. But it's only for people who recognize they need it. You and I have no right to look down upon anybody. Each and any, every one of us is in desperate need of forgiveness for our sin, for our iniquity, because it has separated us from God. And when you, by faith, confess Christ as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and ask him to forgive you because you have things that need forgiveness, he will save you. If you are feeling like an outsider, you're a step ahead. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you know, forgive me for those times where I thought, where I've thought, where I still do think that there's something in me that warrants your special favor. Father, just like that woman recognized, I must publicly confess, who have I got in heaven but you? Where would I go if not for you? What would I lean back upon? What merit would I bring forward? What could I put on the table that would give me any standing before you? Father, I pray you know, in one way, people could leave, oh, that's a press, depressing message for the beginning of kickoff. Or it could be the most glorious news they've ever heard that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how far gone, none are out of your reach. 
a contrite heart you will not despise. God, may we come to you with faith, believing in who you are, and with humility, acknowledging we need you. In Jesus' name, amen.